Okay, back on the uh, Filco 1802. Uh, last time I was working on the G1 side of the chassis and have basically completed the recapping work underneath of the chassis with a couple exceptions and it's something that I wanted to go over with you guys in this video especially if you are new to this hobby of restoring vintage TVs uh, it's a subject that I think is pretty important uh, and definitely created problems for me when I first started but uh, for those of you that have done this for a while you'll find it rather boring and not very informative uh, but as you can see uh, recapped uh, all of the uh, bumblebee caps and any paper caps there was uh, one electrolytic in here underneath at 10 microfarad right there there were uh, several resistors replaced but a lot of uh, these older resistors were still uh, with intolerance so uh, I left them out and then um, replaced all of the uh, old domino caps like this one uh, with with new mica caps so um, that's all been done so the next step will be to go up on the top side of the chassis and start working on the can capacitors but I wanted to point out something to you you might notice that there's still two of these domino type capacitors uh, still in the circuit here. And the reason for that is um, when, when you start out, usually when you start out working on vintage televisions, first thing everybody will tell you is to get a copy of the SAMs, which is fine. That's what you should do. And the neat thing about the SAMs is you get a schematic, you get a parts list, and then you get these neat little pictures of... Uh, what the underside of this chassis should look like and one page will have capacitors the next page will have the resistor locations and if you mm -hmm. notice what I've done um, even though I've, I've worked on one of these these chassis before uh, there's the other G1 chassis from the 2151 that I've referenced um, in the first video of this series um, every time I change a capacitor I make a note of it here and I draw a line to it and highlight it. I also go into the description, cross it off there, and then I also go into the schematic and try to take a look at what it is, where it's at, what it's for, so that I have an understanding of you know what that capacitor does. So in this case, in this TV set, you can see I went all the way around and I've highlighted all the capacitors. That M3 is the fuse, verified that good, that's good. And then C2 and C3 are on the top. So that's what I'm gonna tackle next. So you can tell that I've done every capacitor that Sam shows me that I should do, except for one. It's C92. It's a 270 picofarad cap, and they show a picture of it right there. And you can see I got a note, cap not in chassis originally, okay? And by that I mean right here is where that cap should be. And you can see on this lug, there's nothing. And uh, there's no obvious sign that somebody like cut it out or desoldered it during a repair and took it out. So, the next step is to go back to your schematic and go just exactly, just exactly what is that cap? Well, it's a cap that, that comes off of the um, horizontal frequency can. This WH means this is a white wire that comes directly out of that coil, goes to that cap, and then goes to ground. So... If you go to the horizontal frequency can, if I can find it here in the camera, that is right there. And I know it's hard to tell, but that's the white wire. So you can follow it around and around, and it connects right here, which is odd 
because that connection is ground. Why isn't it connected here? And then a 270 picofarad cap, okay, should be connected there. The white wire should be connected there. One leg of the cap's there and one leg of the cap is to ground. That's what it shows on the schematic. Hmm. So, when I first started out doing this type of stuff, um, you know, I usually only had the SAMs and I was somewhat confused. Um, but then I started collecting other information and what I'm looking at here is, is a Wallace's. This is for Philco TVs from 1947 to 1953. And it has all the sets that were manufactured during those dates. And the interesting thing about this information is you can go and look at the schematic. And that's what I'm doing here. And we're looking at the same can. And sure enough, it shows the same thing. There's a white wire that comes out of this coil, comes down, goes through a 270 picofarad cap, and then it's connected to ground. So, what's the story here? Well, if you go back, and the neat thing about these books is, remember when I talked about runs? This has all the service data and changes for all the different runs during that production time. And so you can see here, I hope you can see that, reason for change, description of change, new part or part removed and then here's your run number so remember got run five here run 10 here so what this is telling me is anything from run five and lower or up would apply to this chassis because it's run five if you come down here this is run 9p and 10 and then you know, you go back up and you can see all the production changes since then. Your SAMs generally are typically right after this thing leaves the factory. And in fact, the schematic on this is probably uh, not long after it left the factory. So what happens is when these start getting out into the field, when they're a new chassis with the original schematic, things start happening and servicemen go out I saw what the problems were, report back to the engineers in the factory, and hence you have all these changes. Okay, so let's take a look and read through this. To imp improve horizontal sync performance. Okay, and, and keep in mind, this is the horizontal circuit that we're looking at. Horizontal oscillating oscillator grid blocking condenser C808, which is that 200... 70 picofarad cap in the Wallace's schematic was reconnected between the green lead from T800, which is the horizontal frequency can, and pin 4, the horizontal oscillator tube. Now this is, this is what's key. The white lead from T800 is now grounded. Okay, so if we go back and look at the SAMs, Where's that white lead at? Here we go. That white lead now is grounded. It's going to be grounded, but it's just it's not going to go through a cap to ground. So that's why our white wire here goes directly up here and through here and connects the ground. And there's no cap. Because they moved the cap, as they said in the Wallace, it's connected between T800 Okay, it's connected between T800 and, and, um, and pin 4 of the horizontal oscillator tube. So, that cap was moved, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not, but this wire now coming out here, you can't really tell, but it's green. It runs underneath that cap and it goes right here. It connects to this cap, which was not on the sand. It should not be there. It's why, why I know that is, is because I marked off all the caps that were in the picture. 
And then the other side of that cap comes out here and the wire runs around and it connects right here. And that's pin four of the horizontal oscillator tube. And that's exactly what it's saying that we should do. It should be connected to pin four. So in essence, a cap of 270 picofarads, like this one right here, used to be right there, and they made a change and they moved it there. But that's not what the schematic shows. And interesting to note, that was on run eight that they did that. If you come over here to my run five and look at what I did, there's a 270 picofarad cap and it's right where the schematic says it should be. Okay. So that's one thing. The other thing is, and I ran into this on the other chassis on the run five, there's a cap here. It's nowhere to be found on this SAMS chart. It's, it's just not there. I've done all the caps that they show. It's not there. So what's up with that? Well, if you look at um, this first one that impacted on run four. So it should impact both chassis. Run four, the second note under the description of change is an 82 micro microfarad um, or picofarad condenser was added from the junction of the above part and R804 to ground. Okay, so they're talking about a 27K half watt resistor and then junction of C800. Well, that happens to be right here. And that's what that is. Okay. And that's why, if you look at my run 5, I had the same thing. There's that 82 picofarad cap. That cap was added since the schematic was created. Which is confusing as hell. The first time you ever work on a TV, you're like, wait a minute, there's a cap in here. It's not showed. It's not anywhere on the schematic. There's, in fact, in the parts list, there's no 80, 82 picofarad cap called for in the entire set. So what's the story? Well, this is the story. This is a production change. And, and sometimes they're very, very important. It'll, it'll definitely make your set play better. Um, if, you, if you take note of all the production changes and ensure that the runs that you have um, are, are put back. Now, what you could do is, you know, I could have pulled these parts. Could have pulled this part and this part. And then, you know, you end up with something like this, a domino cap, which you can go online and learn how to read the values of these. And I could have changed it, shrugged my shoulders and went on and not really cared or understood, you know, why those parts were there. It would have just been confusing because the SAMS says it's not supposed to be there, but they are there. And as long as it doesn't look like a hack and it looks like it came from the factory, well, Philco must have known what they were doing when they built it, it would just seem odd that there should be a cap here and then all of a sudden it's up here. Uh, but you know, you could have went through, pulled those out, cut them out, identified what the values of them were and uh, made the change and you know, your end result would be that the set would play the way it was intended to uh, based upon the run and the chassis that you got. But anyway, I, I just thought that, you know, something that I discovered when I first started out in this hobby. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys don't bother to do this much documentation or notation of what they're doing within the schematic. Um, and, you know, some guys may have immediately recognized that and said, oh, well, that's what they did. They moved this cap from here to here. Well, uh, I wouldn't have figured that out. That would have confused me. I still would have pulled the part probably and just tried to find out the value and, and put it back the way I found it. But production changes. And even though you have the same chassis, um, if the runs aren't exactly the same, you're gonna see two different two different circuits.
So that's all I wanted to point out, point out on that. Okay, now what we're going to do is we are going to uh, work on removing the can filter caps. Uh, what we're looking at here is, this is C2. It is 120 microfarad. I think it's a three, 300 volt cap. And as you can see, it has this cardboard outline on it. Um, and we're going to take that off. Um, this is the second of, of two of these types cap caps. I've, I've changed the first one. But the way uh, we're going to get that cardboard off there is to uh, put some heat on it. There's glue up in the top that holds that on. And once we get that glue loosened up, we'll be able to pull this cardboard off and then uh, get after the rest of the cap. So I'm just going to heat it up real good. Try not to get too much heat on anything else other than that cap. Not get it on those output transformers. Got to be careful. These things are uh, pretty delicate. Be careful not to burn yourself. It came right off. Um, just a cardboard sleeve. It has a little bit of plastic in it. And I don't know if you can see that or not. I don't know if it's going to focus in on that, but that's uh, 120 microfarad at 150 volts. So uh, we'll discard this to save that for later use. Put it back on there. And then now what we'll do is. We'll under, unsolder this from the underside and and pull that out, but we can uh, we'll be able to get that that tar and stuff off of it a lot easier uh, once I get it out of out of the chassis. Okay, so got the capacitor out of the chassis now, and this is a single capacitor. It's a 120 ohm, 150 volt um, capacitor, filter capacitor and you can see here there's only one lug coming out uh, there were three wires attached to that and then um, there was one wire touched to ground so that's the ground for this capacitor and uh, what I like to do <clears throat> every time I pull one of these uh, capacitors is do a little capacitance check uh, just to see how um, or what condition this capacitor was in. So pulled out my Heathkit capacitor checker and uh, we'll check this capacitor out. So right now I have it on uh, bridge, which I'm not sure if this eye tube is going to come through very well on the camera, but... At the most, where that eye opens is where the capacitance is. And on um, this particular capacitor, it's it's right on. It should be on this, this scale right here. And it's showing about 120 microfarads, which is not bad. It's where it should be. But then the problem of leakage comes. So we're going to do a leakage test. And how this works is when I put it on leakage, this eye should close and then it should open back up. And if it doesn't open back up, that means the capacitor is leaky. So I'm going to go ahead and flip it to leakage. It's coming open ever so slowly. But it is coming open. Um, 
So for all intents and purposes, um, well, no, wait a minute. I made a mistake. I have it on 50 volts. I'm going to put it on 150 to where it's rated. And that made a whole lot of difference. As you can see, it's not going to open at all. So that capacitor would not have been good in this set. I'm going to discharge it now so I don't smoke myself and hooking this. You have to be careful with capacitor checkers. They are putting they are putting voltage on the caps that you're checking. And this is the cap that we're going back with. It's 120 microfarad, 450 volts. Obviously the voltage is overkill as it called for 150 volts, but that won't hurt anything. Got that connected up. Now let's put it on bridge. So you can see through, I moved through the dial, closes the eye. And as I move the dial, where it gets to its widest opening. It shows the capacitance and that's right on 120. Right on 120 microfarad. So that's exactly where we need that cap to be. Now let's look at the leakage on this. Now, the way this capacitor checker works uh, with bigger electrolytics, it takes a while for it to uh, open up, but it should eventually open. So uh, we're going to turn it on 400. And it, it's starting to open. Can't really tell that on the camera. It's starting to open. And it opened all the way up. So, at 400 uh, volts, that capacitor's not leaky. It only needs to be rated at 150. So, we're going to be more than, more than in good shape on this capacitor. I'm going to uh, discharge it because believe it or not, I've been dumb enough to uh, not do that and then touch these leads and get a pretty nice little little jolt. So this capacitor is going to go and to this can and uh, we'll open this up and, and take a look and see what what it looked like inside. Now, before I uh, before I open this cap up, I'm going to go ahead and get all this residue off, and I'll show you how I do that. I just simply take a rag and hold the bottom of the cap, and take the old heat gun and heat all that tar up. Just like if I was trying to remove the, out, the outward cardboard piece. Get that good and hot. Doesn't take a lot. See, it just comes right off, or most of it will. Yeah, it's not that big of a deal with a cap like this. Um, you know, it's kind of like, all right, well, that's nice. You got this cap good and clean. Um, because this, this cardboard is, is going to go right back over it just like it was but um, I don't know I just I just like to get the 
get the goo off of it and then um, any stubborn stuff that you can't get off you can um, can use some lacquer thinner on the rag and, and get that off so you'll eventually get a nice clean cap Okay, so here we go. We've got the capacitor um, cut. And how I do that is usually I take a piece of paper and wrap it around the capacitor and then I take a Sharpie and mark a line, uh, circle all the way around. I also will do an up and down line so I know how the can goes back together. And I usually just use this little um, hacksaw like tool that I got at Lowe's and uh, just slowly go around um, the line that I've drawn and you can usually get a pretty good cut. I like to try to keep the cut as clean as possible. Uh, some guys will use Dremel tools um, and other uh, like box cutter knives because this is really thin. Um, and so there's several different ways you can do it, but I, I found that this one's this is does a pretty good job uh, because after we get the, the the insides out of the capacitor and and put the new capacitor in, then I'll come back with some of this aluminum tape and tape it up and try to make that look as clean as possible um, so it looks like it's unmolested. So what I usually try to do now then is just pull pull the bottom part out and it usually will just come right out and then and you can check to see if you can get it out but sometimes they'll just come right out without like this one's gonna do it perfect uh, without heating it up or anything and uh, insides just come right out and there's the uh, capacitor um, if that didn't work, then generally what I'll do is I'll take a corkscrew, wine bottle corkscrew, screw it in, and take the heat gun to it, and, you know, put a little heat on the end, and it'll come right out. Sometimes, like this one, it just comes right out. And this is still fairly moist um, on the inside. It's just paper and this conductive material. So what I'll do next, getting this prepped for the new cap is I'll just go through and get this rest of the crap that's in there out. Cut this connection out. We won't be using that. Because what I'll do is I'll come in with the drill and drill a couple of holes. One for the positive lead to go right here to be attached there and then uh, one for the negative lead to be attached to one of the mounting lugs. So what I usually do is um, work on this stuff with just simply a screwdriver and then the other thing that you can do is you can pour some um, like lacquer thinner in there and let it set for a while and it'll it'll eat out the rest of that um, stuff that's on the inside of this can. You just want to make sure you have enough area for your your cap to go down in there. And um, with this being a single single capacitor can it's not as critical now when you get to some that have three and four different capacitors in there um, you know, you have to get a little bit creative and, and, uh, stack the capacitors on each other. Usually use some, um, and some, a lot of shrink tubing and some, uh, hot glue to make sure that none of the leads from any of the capacitors touch each other. So there you go. And then when, when we put it back together, like I said, it'll look. It'll look like that. Put a thin strip of tape on it and uh, uh, 
this cap's a little bit different because it doesn't really matter what you do on the outside of it. It's going to have this go back over it. But if it was one that, that doesn't have that covering, you want to make sure that you, you want to make sure you do as good a job as you can cutting that in half and trying to keep the look of the, of the cap the way it originally was. Okay, so uh, got the uh, holes drilled into the bottom of the can here, and uh, the positive side is going to go right in the center and the negative toward the outside. And uh, what I'm going to do now is just simply take a little bit of hot glue. glue all around that base, kind of anchor that capacitor down in there. I can do this without getting glue all over myself. It takes quite a bit, but once that glue hardens up, that cap won't go anywhere to keep the cap from moving around. that. There we go. Let that harden up good. And then we'll come back and very simply line this thing up like so. Just like that. some of our aluminum tape and this stuff is a little difficult to work with get that cap line just right. Once you get it started, it's not bad. Okay. And like I said, on this cap, it's not that big a deal. I'm not really taking my time. I'd cut this tape much thinner if it was one that was going to be exposed. I just go around it a couple times. You can hear we're getting some thunderstorm action out there. So there we go. Leads are all back together. Then the last step is take just a a little bit of hot glue, shoot it down into the top of this can, like so, and then just position our cap right back down in there. Make sure it's nice and firm to the top. Feel the heat coming through there, but the wax will melt pretty quick. Then I'll go through and I'll um, solder this positive connection to the lug, clip the excess lead, and then I'll reinstall the cap into the chassis um, because I'll have to um, lead this lead uninstalled so that it can the lug can slip through. Solder that up, reconnect the wires, and solder it back up. So you know the cap's going to go right back in and. No one will ever know that that cap has been restuffed. So then um, the last cap on this chassis will be this one. This is a three section. It's a 10, 100, and 20 microfarad. So these three caps will need to go inside. And I'm not quite sure how the configuration will work at this point, but I'll worry about that when I get to it. 
Okay. So after I get that done, then the the um, power chassis or the sweep chassis um, should be ready um, to be reinstalled in the cabinet, and then it will be on to the uh, the RF chassis, which we'll pick up with uh, next time. Okay. Thanks for watching.